Welcome to Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. I'm Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Australia is facing its most significant challenges since World War II. Geopolitical tensions are increasing. Cultural self-confidence is in decline. The values which define us, freedom, democracy, egalitarianism and sacrifice are being put to the test. Over this special podcast series, Tony and I discuss how Australia can survive and flourish in the decades ahead. Well, hello, Tony, and g'day to all of our listeners. Great to be back with you for another episode of Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. Today, we'll be discussing the voice to parliament and so-called fact-checking, as well as Tony Abbott's great speech in the Ukraine and what Tony believes needs to be done next uh, on that vital component of the war there. Tony, great to be back. Thanks, Dan. Uh, It's great to know that this podcast is setting the agenda and driving uh, the news uh, today, in the context of the voice to parliament, there was uh, another so-called fact check, this time by the Australian Associated Press. Uh, they were fact checking uh, comments and analysis that you provided to this podcast earlier this year about how the government is stacking the deck against mainstream Australians who don't want to be divided by race. You made the very simple observation in this context that, um, and this was back in February mm-hmm. of this year, uh, prior obviously to the May budget, uh, that um, the No campaign had not received any tax deductible status, but the Yes campaign had by virtue of the October budget mm-hmm. last year. Now that is 100% factually true. One, 100% correct. It was 100% correct in February. It's 100% correct now. And it is deeply, deeply unfair. And it's a sign of a government which is doing everything it can to rig the outcome of this referendum that since the budget last year, uh, the Yes campaign has had tax deductibility. And to this day, despite the promises that the government has made, the No campaign does not have tax deductibility. Now, it's absolutely essential um, if the Australian people are to be confident Uh, that there is some skerrick of fairness left in this country, uh, that the No campaign gets tax deductibility straight away. And isn't this just further evidence that these fact-checking units, I mean, the IPA has been fact-checked by RMIT, Mm. ABC and the AAP Mm. as well. Mm. I mean, these are just partisan organisations being weaponised essentially to campaign for the yes vote, in my view, as clear demonstration of the desperation that the yes campaign has. There's absolutely no doubt that there does appear to be uh, an almost obsessive focus on one side, uh, a desire to find fault with one side, and um, the other mob can get away with what they like. I mean, the government is constantly claiming uh, that there is a, a superabundance of detail uh, about about the voice proposal. Well, uh, plenty of words have been written but there is no specificity uh, about any of it. And if you actually go on to the uh, government's supposed information uh, site, uh, everything is to be done after the event. Mm. I mean, we still don't know uh, how members of The Voice would be chosen. Uh, It's said that they would be chosen by local communities uh, in accordance with... uh, local cultural practices. Does that mean there'll be an election? Does that mean it's going to be the traditional owners? Does that mean it's going to be the local big man? Mm. Is it going to be the person with the loudest voice or the most money? I I mean, these are basic questions about the voice which people are entitled to have answers to before we sign a blank cheque to the government and the parliament for the biggest change we've ever been asked to make with our constitution. Yeah, look, that's right. And to me, this gets to a much bigger point, which is the reason why these fact-checking units are are deliberately pulling the wool over the eyes of Australians is because they know that when the facts about the voice are heard, people are much more likely to vote no, whether it's it's in our constitution, the High Court will be involved, uh, it's only going to be available to Australians based on their racial or ethnic background. We've seen polling, for example, showing very rapid decline now. Support is only between 50 and 55%, down from about 75% a year mm-hmm. ago. Clearly, they don't want Australians to know the facts. This is exactly right. Um, but look, uh, I think people are starting to get the message that this is much more complicated than the government has led them to believe, that it has the potential to be much more intrusive uh, 
uh, than the government is letting on. Mm. Uh, it's interesting. Um, the Prime Minister has been saying uh, from the very beginning that this is simply a modest change. Mm. A modest uh, that's what he tells. Even. That's what he. <laughs> that's what he tells the Australian public. That's what he wants the voters to think. And yet, he went to uh, Adelaide earlier this week uh, to give the Lowitcher O'Donoghue lecture, where he said, "Let this be no modest change. Let this be no modest change," because he's really giving a different message to different people. Mm. To the public, nothing to see here. Uh, to the Indigenous activists, this is the restoration of the sovereignty that you lost from 1788. This is uh, essentially um, uh, a change that will mean that nothing of significance can happen uh, without effectively Indigenous consent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why distinguished lawyer after distinguished lawyer uh, submitting to the inquiry mm -hmm. uh, people like... Uh, uh, Justice Callanan, uh, Justice Cole, uh, former Justice uh, um, David Jackson, mm -hmm. very significant, uh, great legal minds uh, were submitting to this uh, parliamentary inquiry, the inquiry that was really not given anything like the time that it needed to do a proper job. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they were submitting to the inquiry. Um, a, this is extremely complex. B, it's extremely uncertain. Uh, and C, and most significantly, it divides us mm. by race. It creates a country where we are no longer one and equal. And frankly, anything that stops this country from being one and equal is just dead wrong and it should be stopped. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just, I just want to finish this chat about the, the fact checkers because mm. – um, you know, people may or may not be aware that what actually happens with this fact checking is not just that it's put out there in the public domain, but uh, the the social media companies then put a a tag on the post. So if you're on Facebook and you can go to one of the posts that's included your analysis, it'll now have a, a tag underneath it that says, "Oh, this is you know misleading information that's been presented here." We've also had posts the IPA has, and I think other organisations where it's actually blurred out. <laughs> You're not actually allowed allowed to see it if it were some kind of obscene mm. um, material. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the government, these fact checkers and big tech that are rigging the game, stacking the deck and censoring opinion. And, and look, I've never been one uh, to uh, go out and complain much. Uh, I, I don't believe in conspiracies and things like that. As my great mentor, B.A. Santa Maria, always used to say, stuff up beats conspiracy every time as an explanation. But we do seem to be seeing an extraordinary amount of politically correct censorship going on now. Um, I mean, the classic example of politically correct censorship was when um, the social media companies banned Donald Trump. Now, whatever you think of Donald Trump, the guy who is the president, the former president of the United States, surely deserves a voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if Ayatollahs and uh, the leaders of Taliban uh, can freely use social media, <laughs> surely Donald Trump ought to be allowed to use social media. And 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 this fact checking business, um, which seems to be extremely selective, is just another form of social media censorship. Yep, absolutely. Politically correct social media censorship. What should the government do about it? Well, look, uh, I gather that uh, when it suits these people, uh, the social media big tech giants, they say, oh, we're not publishers, we're just platforms. Well, if you're a platform, everyone should have access. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a publisher, well, sure, you can then pick and choose about what goes up, but you've got to also have all the obligations of publishers. That's to say you can be sued for defamation, um, you're subject to the normal regulation, which the media is subject to, mm. uh, um, truth and fairness uh, rules, etc. cetera. So, so look, they can't have it both ways. Um, now, uh, my general disposition is to be a deregulationist, uh, but certainly... Uh, in a situation like this, uh, we've got uh, an extremely important referendum coming up. Um, there is a massive tide of money um, and politically correct opinion, 
the weight of government all on one side, mm-hmm. uh, I think it, it's incredibly unfair if if the people who are doing their best under difficulties uh, to put an alternative position have got this mm. added handicap. Yep, so I'm just going to hold this up. This is the AAP fact check, so you can, you can check this out. If we can see it there, this is the... The podcast here, making making news and, and making waves, Tony, which is what what we like. So, look, plenty more to talk about on on the voice mm-hmm. and this censorship issue as as we uh, keep going. As you know, the the bill just passed the lower house, so to go into the Senate uh, later this month, mm-hmm. and the sitting fortnight, and then the campaign proper will start. So, much more to discuss there. Now, let's move on to Ukraine and, and the Russia situation. So, you were in Ukraine recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, you delivered a landmark speech there which was published in the, was it the Weekend Australian, mm-hmm. I believe, recently. Um, can you just give us a, an overview of what, what it was you were doing in Ukraine and what it was that you had to say? Well, Dan, I've been keen to show as much solidarity as I can with the incredibly heroic Ukrainian people who are facing a genocidal war uh, from uh, from the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, who is dead set on recreating greater Russia. Uh, Ukraine is his current target. But uh, if Ukraine falls, uh, um, the Baltic states, uh, Georgia, Moldova, uh, perhaps Poland mm-hmm. are all next because they were all part uh, of greater Russia mm. uh, back in the day. Um, uh, it's, it's a very, very serious and dangerous prospect that the world has before it, before it here. And I believe that uh, by resisting so fiercely and thus far so successfully, the Ukrainians aren't just fighting for their own freedom, they're in a sense fighting for all free countries. And I think it's beholden on all of us to do whatever we reasonably can uh, to help the Ukrainians. And when I got the invitation to uh, uh, address the Kyiv Security Forum, uh, it's been going now for more than a decade. Uh, the principal organiser is uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, uh, who is a former Prime Minister of, of Ukraine. I was only too happy uh, to accept the invitation. Uh, I was there in person. Um, uh, former Prime Minister of Estonia was there in person. Um, uh, Paula Dobransky, who was a senior figure in the Reagan administration, was there in person. Uh, people like Boris Johnson, uh, George W. Bush, General David Petraeus beamed in uh, to the conference uh, uh, on Teams. Uh, so it was a it was a pretty uh, former president Petro Poroshenko of Ukraine mm. uh, obviously was there. Uh, various Ukrainian MPs and ministers uh, were there. Um, it was a pretty uh, strong and impressive demonstration of solidarity with the people of Ukraine mm. in their time of need. But in the end, a conference is just words, uh, encouraging words, welcome words, uh, uplifting words in many in many instances. What the Ukrainians really need is tangible help. And this is where uh, I so hope that uh, when Prime Minister Albanese goes to the NATO conference in a few weeks' time, he won't come just with words. He'll come with a serious... Uh, and big package of armaments for the Ukrainians. Uh, obviously, we've given them um, just shy of 100 Bushmasters so far. Uh, reports from the front are that the Bushmasters have been doing excellent work. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them have been destroyed in combat, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they've done excellent work. I don't see why we can't give them a couple of hundred more. Uh, we have about a 1,000 in stock. They're mouldering away in depots in this country at the moment. Mm. I think they'd be much better deployed to the Ukraine Mm -hmm. uh, and used by the Ukrainian armed forces. Then there's the issue of the Hawkeye. Now, uh, I can remember driving a Hawkeye as Prime Minister. Now, that must have been eight or nine years ago. Um, This particular Hawkeye was uh, uh, probably one of the early models, but I was able to drive it around. my understanding is that the Hawkeye has not yet actually been formally delivered uh, to the Australian Army because of what seem to be minor technical faults. There's some issue with the ABS braking system, apparently. Um, there's some uh, issue with corrosion, apparently. Nevertheless, uh, there's some 1,000 of them that have been built. Um, why aren't these vehicles operational? Uh, I mean, what is wrong uh, 
with our defence procurement if a 1,000 Hawkeyes built by Talus here in Australia in Bendigo, what is wrong with defence procurement if these vehicles are not fully operational uh, almost 10 years after the first of them were at mm. least sufficiently roadworthy for a Prime Minister uh, to drive one around uh, the Talus uh, testing ground? Now, now, something is wrong here. Mm. Now, the Ukrainians... They know about Hawkeye. I think the Ukrainians would like to use Hawkeye as a mobile missile launcher. Mm -hmm. They apparently have uh, bits of ordnance that they would like to strap on the back uh, and, and use in the battle space. Now, why can't we give it to them? Why can't we give them a couple of hundred Hawkeyes? Again, if there's a thousand of these uh, light armoured vehicles uh, sitting in a depot uh, uh, in and around Bendigo, Let's get them operational and let's get them to where they're going to do some good. Mm. Now, in terms of your, your time in Ukraine, did you get much of a sense of the sort of the, the, the morale and the spirit of, of the people there? What was it like on the ground? Are they sort of optimistic? Are they a bit sort of uh, war weary? What, what's, what's your assessment? I don't want to um, claim to have an encyclopedic knowledge uh, here. Mm. Um, and I was only in country for 48 hours or so. Um, but it seems to me that there is just uh, an extraordinary resolution uh, to win. Uh, there is, it seems to me, an indefatigable quality to the Ukrainian people. They are determined that they are not going to lose their independence yet again having been so subjugated for most of the last four or 500 years, they, they, they are cherishing their freedom uh, and they are prepared to fight and die for it. I mean, something like uh, 30% uh, of military-aged males uh, in Ukraine are currently one way or another in uniform. Mm. Uh, it is a national mobilisation which has taken place uh, to uh, defend and preserve the country. Mm -hmm. um, in Kyiv itself, uh, they are making huge efforts uh, to be as normal as possible. For instance, uh, uh, when they have a blast damage, it's repaired almost immediately. There was a terrible attack in October, for instance, uh, where two uh, Russian missiles uh, hit uh, civilian uh, centres killed uh, in one instance, uh, I think nine people were incinerated in their cars on an intersection. That intersection was repaired within 24 hours. Uh, another missile that same, uh, that same morning hit uh, a children's playground. Now, luckily, there were actually no children there at the time. Um, I was taken by a friend of mine uh, to, uh, to, to look at this playground. It's been completely repaired and uh, the only... Uh, evidence of what happened is the trees uh, surrounding the playground still obviously have blast damage. Mm. You know, there are buildings that have got shrapnel damage and so on. Uh, uh, different parts of Kiev obviously uh, were subject of running battles in the opening days of the, of the, of the war. Mm -hmm. But um, you've got to say uh, they are bearing up, at least so it seemed to me, uh, incredibly well. But I guess, uh, uh, as Viktor Frankl said in his uh, famous book, uh, uh, if you have a why, mm. you can bear almost any how. And they've got a why. Mm. Uh, they want to preserve their nation. And that is keeping them going through the most incredible and difficult circumstances. Mm. And uh, Tony, I think uh, reflecting on your prime ministership, I think that there's many, uh, many aspects of your leadership that have been proven more right as time go goes by, whether it was the first budget that mm -hmm. you delivered, as we've talked about many times, whether it was your foresight when it came to the carbon tax and the mining tax and the issue of also of migration and so forth. Uh, but you also famously said that you were going to shirt front Mm -hmm. Putin and, and confront him over his, his behaviour and activities and, of course, the usual kind of inner-city mm. media elites ridiculed mm. you about that. Uh, but your assessment of, of Putin almost a, de a decade ago has, has proven to be more correct as, as time and, goes by. And, and, look, we should never forget that 38 Australians were murdered 
uh, in Putin's first invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, what happened in 2014, first of all, the little green men assault on Crimea, uh, and then the stooge proxy uh, uprising in, uh, in the Donbass. I mean, this was Putin's first invasion. And it was a Russian missile battery that went across the border into Ukraine, brought down MH17, uh, slaughtered 298 innocent people, including 38 Australians. We should never, ever forget that. He has Australian blood on his hands. And as I said to him back then, maybe you did not order this thing to fire at that particular aircraft, but you allowed uh, this uh, strategic weapon uh, to be deployed in an evil campaign. Uh, uh, these people died as a result. Uh, at the very least, you owe an apology and compensation. And, of course, he went on and on about how it was Ukrainian provocateurs, um, the Ukrainians were all fascists, uh, Ukraine had no right to exist. All of these horrible lies which he's been peddling uh, again uh, more recently, uh, he was peddling back then. It was patently false back then. It's patently false now. Um, this genocidal aggression simply has to be defeated. Mm. Well, Tony, I know you're a very busy man. I just want to round out this conversation uh, a bit earlier. You mentioned NATO, mm -hmm. and I know you've had um, you know, a lot to say about NATO and, and its potential role here. Uh, I know there's been talk about a potential expansion to NATO, mm -hmm. and that's been a topic of conversation mm -hmm. for many years. Uh, what's your opinion on NATO as it currently stands? Should it be further expanded to more nations? Mm -hmm. What What do you see as its its potential role here? Well, obviously, uh, if Ukraine had been in NATO, uh, there would not have been an invasion. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that weakness can be uh, uh, tempting. Uh, to dictators. Uh, the only thing that bullies understand is uh, is strength. Now, I don't say you meet aggression with aggression. Mm. That's not right. I mean, uh, we have to behave decently and honourably at all times. But nevertheless, you've got to make it crystal clear uh, to, to dictators uh, who are kind of uh, schoolyard bullies only in a geostrategic context and mm. therefore so much more dangerous. You've got to make it crystal clear uh, that that aggression won't pay, mm. that war will not work. And, and so, so I think that uh, um, uh, as soon as is prudent, uh, Ukraine needs to be in NATO. Um, I don't say it should happen tomorrow uh, because, strictly speaking, that means uh, an allied army in Ukraine uh, – and that would obviously escalate the war. Mm -hmm. um, if, for argument's sake, uh, Putin uses uh, nuclear weapons, I think there should be an immediate uh, accession of Ukraine to NATO. Um, uh, as soon as this particular war has been won uh, or resolved one way or another, mm -hmm. I think then Ukraine definitely has to be admitted to NATO. But we also need something NATO-like uh, in uh, in our part of the world. Uh, now, there was years ago uh, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation, or CETO, uh, that basically seemed to uh, um, fall into abeyance sometime in the 1970s. But we do need something NATO-like in East Asia uh, so that uh, the bullies in Beijing are not tempted to uh, try to resolve the status quo with Taiwan by force, because bad though the whole Ukraine war has been, mm. uh, any uh, Beijing attack on Taiwan would be uh, worse by a considerable order of magnitude. Uh, it is, it is, it is. I, I mean, catastrophic though the Ukraine war has been, um, uh, a, a Beijing attack on Taiwan would could be apocalyptic. Uh, that's why. There has got to be the strongest possible message to Beijing, don't do it. Don't even think about it. Mm. Well, Tony, on that note, mm. uh, we'll leave it there and I'll just finish where we began by saying if you've got these left-wing campaign organisations fact-checking mm. your analysis and your assessment, then you know you're having an impact. So I know uh, Australians are very appreciative of your leadership on 
not only on national defence, but certainly on the voice to parliament. And, uh, you know, these fact checkers are not going to stop us or, or shut us up. So we're going to keep going as the debate goes on. So, Tony, um, thank you once again for your insights. Thank you, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.